Okay. Okay, everyone. So um, the recording has restarted. Uh, let's go ahead and see what else Paul talks about as he's making a defense for himself. Okay. So, yeah. So <clears throat> I was just telling us that, you know, he's uh, narrating the incident of his conversion and uh, <clears throat> he mainly talks more about um, uh, what others also were aware, but to clarify certain things, you know, the Jews would have wondered, why is it that this man who uh, is so passionate about, you know, following this Jesus, why is it that he has not come and ministered in a prominent city such as Jerusalem? He's been all over the place. So he's clarifying, he's saying, look, God told me uh, not to minister here. The reason being, you know, at that point, people would not have believed him. Why would people not have believed him? You know, he adds to his explanation and he says that because at that time I was the one imprisoning people. And he also adds, you know, he says that when Stephen, one of the, the ministers of God was killed, this person, you know, uh, Paul, uh, was standing and giving consent to the uh, murder of Stephen. And it is said that you know, he was... After, um, like while Stephen's, uh, his death was happening, so he was even guarding the clothes of those who were, were uh, uh, you know, uh, actively involved in murdering Stephen. So, you know, that shows that he was a clear-cut, recognized, zealous Jew who was now persecuting anyone you know who belonged to a different faith so this kind of a person you know immediately almost immediately they come and they start uh, talking about their conversion uh, it is likely that people won't be able to digest what they are saying people would have assumed that this persecutor <clears throat> is trying to play a game and confuse uh, us and that's the reason you know maybe god also told him okay paul this is not the time so again as we read uh, these things you know we uh, recognize that the holy spirit is the director of the events in the book of acts including the life of paul you know there are certain places where he wanted to go and god says no don't go now uh, there are places where you know uh, he wanted to leave you know we saw in Corinth he was so desperate he was so upset you know by the by the kind of um, attitudes people carried and yet God encourages him and he says there are lots of people here lots of my people are there Paul okay so don't get discouraged you do you do your work so in this way what is God doing you know God knows how to encourage God knows how to lead. God knows how to uh, also prevent us from moving into something which is not uh, the, the right thing for us to do or at the right time. Okay, So it's the leading, the direction of the Holy Spirit that we see throughout the book of Acts and particularly in the journey of Apostle Paul. So he provided all this clarification, all this introduction about himself. Uh, so when they uh, were listening to him, obviously they were they were keenly attuned to what he was sharing. Uh, now that the Jews understood that, hey, this person is one among us, very similar to uh, the the passion that we carry for the faith. So they were ready to listen. But in the speech that Paul made uh, in Jerusalem, one problem happened. Okay, so far everything is going well. He asked the commander, give me one chance to speak. So he says, okay, you speak. He starts narrating. But he once he talks about his passion for the law and for the Jew, Jewish people, he says that God told him, depart for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. So Paul is correct. In what he's saying, okay, he's not hiding or he's not mincing his words. So clearly, he adds to the introduction of himself and says, 
God also. God told me, don't minister in Jerusalem right now. And then God told me, go, I will send you to the Gentiles. Now, the moment he brought up the term Gentiles, the listeners, they lost it. They were like, okay, forget it. You know, whatever he was saying till now, we don't even, why should we even try to understand it? Because they were passionately against the Gentiles. Okay. So you find that the crowd stopped listening to him when he came to this sentence. He said, look, God told me that I will send you to the Gentiles. And at that point, with that one word, in fact, Luke says, they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. So you see, that zeal is making them hate a person from uh, a different community or even a different pattern of thinking. Paul has clarified he's a Jew, but he's for the Gentiles that the people did not like. So how angry did they get with him? They are saying he's not fit to live. So they are ready to kill him. If the commander had not intervened, what would have happened to Paul? Paul would have died. But again, God's timing, God's purpose in Paul's life. God did not, you know, let him be killed. So the commander came, he took charge. Again, the Jews are insisting, come on, let's kill this fellow. Okay, but uh, the commander, he orders and he says, okay, come on, bring this man back now to the barracks or, you know, the place where they would keep the prisoners, bring him back there uh, and uh, let's investigate further. Okay, what actually is going on? Because if we leave him here, these people are going to kill him. So they bring him back and they try to interrogate. It says it's under scourging. Scourging is a, it's a like a, a, a process where they whip you, right? You have these whips and they hit you nicely. So severe scourging. Now imagine, you know, this is what the Holy Spirit was already revealing to him. Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you have to suffer all this. But what did Paul say? I am ready, Lord, not just to suffer, to die also. I am ready. So that is exactly what is unfolding. Goes to the, taken to the barracks. There he is, uh, um, uh, you know, they want to scourge him. Okay. Uh, and, you know, they want to see what else can be done for this, uh, this particular Jewish man, because it, he's become confusing by now. He says he's Jewish. Now he says uh, that God told me to go to the Gentiles. Who is this man? What is he trying to do? So there's so much of confusion. So the commander, uh, he brings him and uh, they start leading him towards the barracks. But look at the wisdom which God gave Paul. Okay, And Paul also knew this is not the time for me to die because he still has to testify of many things. So God gives him the wisdom and Paul asks a question to the commander. He says, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? You remember Paul played this card even uh, uh, in the Philippian, in the Philippian jail when they said, okay, quietly you leave Paul and Silas. He says, how can you leave quietly? I'm a Roman. You, first of all, you did not follow proper process to put us in, in the prison. And now you want to leave us. Okay. You can't do that. So Paul finds that fitting moment to question the authorities. So he says, how, how is it that easily, you know, you will, you will uh, take me in and you will beat me without any, any proper proof, right? He says, I'm uncondemned. I'm not yet condemned. So yeah, interrogation, you want to follow the process, that's fine. But how can you scourge me? Now, Paul asks that question. I'm a Roman citizen. And those days, you know, somebody who was a Roman citizen was, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they had received a privilege. Okay. And those who were not Roman citizens, you know, even nowadays, I, I've observed, you know, people who want to go and live in a particular country and they really, you know, they really desire to do it. 
they pay huge sums of money they go through an entire process uh, for citizenship right pr uh, permanent residency so they do all the hard work to get their paperwork done and finally they can say wow you know i am a citizen of what maybe some first world nation and uh, they are now in um, now able to experience the benefits of that uh, country but here paul he says that i am a roman citizen so those days to have a roman citizenship today also it's difficult you know to get a, a citizenship of a country but those days the roman empire was very renowned to get a citizenship as a roman was probably one of the hardest things so the moment paul revealed i am roman and i am uncondemned the centurion okay, he uh, one among the troop of the commander the centurion heard that he goes to the commander immediately and he says you know take care what you do for this man is roman because if they ill treated a roman you know all the repercussions would follow so centurion alerts the commander please be careful okay don't ill treat him otherwise we could lose our position uh, the Ro romans will come and you know we, we will be in trouble so the commander comes to paul and he says hey are you a roman tell me are you really a roman because he was doubtful he was like this man who mobs are against is claiming to be a roman can this be true you know how can this be true so he questions him and paul says yes i am then the commander says with a large sum of money i obtained the citizenship so obviously the commander was not a born roman citizen okay so he would have wondered where did this man get a lot of money to to buy the citizenship okay uh, he wanted clarification on that so he was really confused that a person who would soon be under trial is claiming citizenship so paul answers he clarifies once again he says look it's not money and all that i was born a roman citizen so the moment paul revealed that you know immediately it says um they they had planned to whip him remember examine under scorgi they withdraw that they say no 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 you can't do that the commander became afraid that he was dealing with a roman uh, and that you know they had also bound this roman so he got scared he was like oh this case is a is a uh, you know uh, it's little tricky because if i end up doing something wrong instead of paul uh, being condemned you know, i will be booked for something uh, you know i will be booked i i will be uh, you know in in a uh, position to lose my authority so the commander understood that so then he decided okay come on let me not deal with this man alone so the next day uh, you know he he wanted to have this person you know examined by a better uh set of authorities so what he does is he brings in <clears throat> the chief priest and the council okay so he kind of makes that possible for the chief priest and the council to now come and examine this case and paul is brought before them so you know from now on what we are going to see is you know, paul is going to be taken from one person to the other person in authority okay and he is going to uh, not just defend himself but he is also going to talk about what god has done in his life so we have already seen that to the jews and even the commander would have heard about that supernatural conversion you know that uh, happened to paul uh, so he narrated that you know? uh, and later on now he is being brought before the the high priest and the council so let's see you know how he makes use of this opportunity so now when he comes there again he starts to address them because paul um, you know he he is defending at least till now he is not like a condemned person or anything and uh, he he didn't really need to hire a lawyer so he is speaking for himself so he stands before the council and in the same way 
and he says men and brethren do you see the the uh, connection that he has with the jewish people he is not saying uh, oh you um, unbelievers you the way he is addressing them also he is showing them that he has a heart for the jewish men and brethren i have lived in all good conscience before god until this day why does he begin his speech like that because he is trying to justify himself he is trying to um tackle the accusations and allegations made against him so he is saying you are telling me that i am not upholding the law that's not true i have lived before god until this day even when he was a jew remember the kind of background that he came he was trying to uphold the law and now more so after he's come to the faith and he has understood about god forgiving uh, you know the sins of mankind and uh, him having a relationship maintaining that relationship with god you know, he maintained that good conscience with before god so he is just starting and beginning to defend himself but what happens the moment you know a person who would go under trial says something like i have a good conscience before god until this day the high priest ananias okay again don't get confused this ananias is different from the ananias that paul talked about in the previous chapter that is a believer damascus who came and prayed for him this is another ananias okay who was a high priest at that time he got offended it's like how dare uh, a, a prisoner you know how dare somebody who's coming for trial justify himself and say i have good conscience i have not done anything wrong you know so ananias got so offended he told somebody who was standing next to paul to strike him on the mouth so they actually hit him on the mouth you can imagine how uh, disrespectful and painful you know that would have felt for paul because he is serving god and he, it's not like he has made a mistake he is innocent but somebody in authority you know commands uh, another person to even hit him okay so it's all painful and it's a, you know for for a man of god to go through that you know, just think about the people who are being persecuted in different parts of the world today you know, they may have lived a good life they may be innocent they may be um, you know uh, even now the trial that they are undergoing it could be for the sake of the gospel but the humiliation which they are experiencing right uh, it's all painful but for the sake of the gospel that's what paul said hey i've signed up for this if this is what it means to live for god i will live for god okay, so he's coming under uh, you know this kind of a treatment so he got beaten but when he got beaten you know, paul was angry okay, paul got really angry he said that uh, god will strike you you whitewashed wall for you sit to judge me according to the law and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law because he he felt that he had been wronged the very reason uh, he had been brought here is so that the leaders the council the high priest they will uphold you know what has been spoken in the law but before asking any anything about paul immediately they are they hitting him so that upset him you know that also shows that he was a man with uh, principles he did not like you know what was being done so he um, just reacts to the incident and at that moment you know somebody uh, tells him do you revile god's high priest so only then paul realizes you know when he has said you know whitewashed whitewashed wall and all he has used certain derogatory words uh, in his reaction so paul realizes that the man whom he had spoken about just now was actually the high priest so you see how much of a law abiding um, uh, you know a jew paul was he immediately apologizes he says i did not know brethren that he was the high priest okay 
So, because God's word, you know, it is written, he says, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So, the moment Paul comes to know that he made a mistake, he actually made an accusation against the high priest. You know, he uh, again presents a defense and says, hey, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I didn't know he was the high priest. I thought he was just, you know, anybody. So, he's still living his life under trial. He's living his life according to the law of God. So at this point, you know, again, God gave Paul the wisdom. So we've already said that, you know, at different points, there is uh, either or, uh, like in Corinth, we, we saw this, in Ephesus, we saw, you know, one of the leaders themselves, they come in and they say, that religious matter, don't bring it to me. You know, if it's a religious matter, uh, uh, if it's a moral issue, then yes, you know, you bring it to me, I can resolve it for you. So in that way, Paul escaped. And again, in Ephesus, you know, if Demetrius has a problem, let him go to the courts. The courts are open. But, you know, don't, don't make this chaos in the city. So Paul escaped. So there are times uh, when God gives us an escape by working through the authorities themselves. You know, even earlier, back up some more, go to when Peter and John, came under trial, even at that time, you know, Gamaliel, he says that if this is a work of God, we cannot stop it. Okay, So that came from one of the leaders. However, right now, when Paul is standing before the courts, uh, or he's standing before the authorities, God gives Paul the wisdom. So as Paul is looking at the council there, he realizes, you know what, this team is a mixture of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he gets an idea. He says, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. So he makes a statement which causes confusion between the existing people there. So we, we understand the background here. The Pharisees, they believed in resurrection. But the Sadducees, you know, they did not believe in, um, you know, uh, the spirits or uh, angels, heavenly beings, uh, or even resurrection. So the moment Paul brought up a subject which was contention, right, for both the parties, it's like confusion in the enemy's camp. They start taking sides. You know, some the Pharisees are like, "Oh, really? You know, they are accusing you for uh, uh, <coughs> believing in resurrection. Resurrection is real. You know, resurrection is true." So the Pharisees would have thought that they must protect Paul. But at the same time, you had the Sadducees, okay, who are also very much part of the authority, but you know, they don't believe in resurrection, and they are like. How can you protect a man who is who believes in resurrection? So there is a there is a confusion, okay, that uh, begins to take place. The Pharisees say we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So when all this confusion is going on, uh, you know the commander again. Remember the commander is in charge of Paul. Why did he bring him here? Because he could not decide. So he thought, okay, let me take them to, let me take him to the next level of authorities. They will solve the problem. But here, it's becoming like the Jerusalem situation, you know, temple situation where, where uh, if the commander did not have the presence of mind to leave, who knows, they could have caught Paul again and started beating him up. If they had an opportunity, they would have even killed him. So the commander quickly, you know, he acts, he tells the soldiers, okay, go down, take uh, Paul, take him back to the barracks. So they protect him. And how did Paul escape this time? Wisdom. Okay. God gave him that statement. And he said, look, am I being judged for uh, the hope and resurrection of the dead? Is that why you all are judging me? And that helped him to escape his own death. Okay, now let's move forward. Now that Paul has been brought back, uh, God 
continues to encourage Paul. You know, and this is again a very beautiful thing when we are ministering and God has called us to minister. Do you see that how closely you know God is observing? things that are happening in our lives. And in ministry here, Paul is going through severe opposition. And in the case of severe opposition, you know, even God understands sometimes that, you know, we are not able to bear uh, the challenges before us. So he directly, in Corinthian encouraged him. Now let's see what God says in verse 11 of um, chapter 23. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So there's a ray of hope there. First of all, God is saying, don't be discouraged. Or in other words, be of good cheer. And then he says, what a witness you have been for me, Paul. You know, angry mobs are listening to you. You're standing there and you, you shared about your encounter. You shared about the truth so boldly. You know something? I want you to also bear witness to me in Rome. Okay? Now, think about this. Currently, where is Paul? He's in Jerusalem. But in a way, God is telling him, you're not going to die, Paul. Then you go to Rome. So there is some more time for the uh, uh, for that moment to come. So you know, it would have really helped him understand God is with him. God is protecting him. I still have time. I'm going through a rough patch, but this is not meant for my death because I have to travel to Rome. Okay, And God is telling me there is an assignment. I have to bear witness at Rome also. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to be afraid of being killed. All right, so in that way, God once again strengthened Paul. God once again, uh, you know, showed him what he would do. Now let's let's uh, continue. So by now we have understood there is a lot of hatred against Paul. Okay, now the extent to which this hatred settled in the hearts of the Jews uh, can be un, can be uh, perceived by what a set of Jews decided. So you find that there were 40 uh, Jews. They joined together and they had a conspiracy. Okay? Conspiracy means uh, you are making a decision against someone you know, to, to, to do something to, to uh, destroy them or do something, you know, uh, to bring them down. So it's a conspiracy. So they plan up against Paul and, what, you know, what was their agenda? Their, their agenda was obviously to kill him. Um, and they took an oath. They said that we are not going to eat or drink till we have killed this man, Paul. So that is the level of hatred. Okay, and these people they came to the chief priests and elders just now. There's been all this commotion about resurrection and all, but still, these Jews they come and they they realize that hey, this man he does not even need a fair trial. Why are you wasting your time time trying to listen to him? How about we just kill him? So they talk to the council, the elders, and they say, Let's do this. Okay, this is the plot, okay, or this is the plan. You bring him as if you are going to listen to him and as if, you know, the fair, um, uh, like, you will go through the proceedings of, you know, whatever needs to be done uh, for a person like this. So you just bring him under that pretext. Let him be there. What we'll do is at that point tomorrow, you know, we, we will catch him and we'll kill him. Okay, you don't worry about that. You follow your process. But... They were so passionately against Paul that they said, we will go and kill Paul. Okay, So this was the conspiracy against him. But you see, you know, God brings escape in so many different ways. We've already talked about it. This time around, you know, Luke records that one of Paul's, uh, there was Paul's sister's son who heard 
of this. How is it possible for Paul's sister son to hear it? It is likely, you know, Paul was from that, you know, that that strong Jewish background. Okay, learned Jewish background, and maybe his relatives were still part of that, you know, Jewish tradition and Jewish culture and all that. And he had, you know, a, a close relative like his sister, whose son was connected, you know, to the authorities. That, that's the possibility. He was probably connected. And we don't know of his faith, whether he believed in Jesus or, you know, if uh, he was uh, just a Jew like the others there. But because of the relationship, you know, sometimes there are people, even today, there are people who are in the faith. Maybe their family members are not in the faith, but out of relationship, you know, they could warn us and say, hey, this is happening. You better get out of here. Right? So in that manner, Paul's sister's son, he heard about what was planned against Paul. And he quickly went to the barracks and he told the uh, one of the centurions. Okay? And when the centurion heard this, you know, again, the way, Paul, um, the way Luke writes, he's a, a doctor and a historian and a very, very systematic individual. So he writes the orders, okay, the ranks, he says, the uh, son goes to the com the centurion. The centurion directs him to the commander, and the uh, person reveals this to the commander. Okay, and he says, "Paul, the prisoner, called called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you." So the centurion shared this, and uh, the boy, the the son tells him they are waiting to kill Paul. Okay. So the moment the commander comes to know this, you know, he realizes, oh man, uh, what is going on? You know, if, if this man is killed again, you, you remember, he was already quite intrigued that uh, Paul is a Roman citizen. Okay. Now, a Roman citizen under his care uh, is going to be killed. If that happens, you know, whether the uh, the council and the high priest are aware of it or not. The commander was well aware that he would lose his job. Worse, he would run the risk of losing his life also. So he has to act quickly, isn't it? The commander. So the wisdom that the commander had is, you know, he tells he tells this boy, okay, thank you for letting me know uh, the plan. Please don't tell anybody that you have told me these things and the commander thinks what can i do how can i uh, follow the legal process so that under my care nothing happens to this roman citizen by the name of paul so he decides okay come on let me send him elsewhere let me send him to the governor okay so maybe that was the next step for the commander to follow so he decides, and this governor uh, lived in Caesarea. Okay, and he uh, was called Felix. So now, you know, uh, uh, this commander does the usual process of handing over you know, a person who uh, is to be tried, and that is to write a letter. So he writes a letter, uh, and he says, "Okay, you know, this man." Uh, we seized, he was seized by the Jews and he was about to be killed. Uh, uh, but, you know, I rescued him. So you see, he's making it clear that he has done nothing evil to a Roman citizen. And then he says, okay, the moment we learned that, and then later, once I rescued him, I learned that he was a Roman. Um, and, you know, I tried all the things that I needed to do. I brought him to the council and all. But then, you know, there... I didn't find that there is any charge against him which is worthy of death. Okay. However, because he is being accused in this way, how about you know, Felix, you take up the interrogation further? So that is the letter that he writes to Felix, and he wants to send Paul over to Felix for the next round of trial. And once he does that, you notice here uh, that he comes up with 
a good plan to make Paul escape. So what does he do? He orders soldiers to uh, take charge. Okay, and uh, it's it's really beautiful because he he sort of sends an entire troop. Okay. To protect Paul, now you can imagine. You know, these are all. Uh, you would say that human beings are doing this when Paul is under trial. You know, a commander uh, is is uh, providing protection and all that. But it, it's actually God, don't you think so? Because it was not yet Paul's time. So God gave His wisdom to the commander, and you see how the the mm, plot against. Paul also came to light. Nobody would have ever known it. If the chief priest would have called Paul, those 40 Jewish men who are passionately against Paul, you know, they would have murdered him. But you know, God had a way of bringing that matter out. And then the wisdom through which the commander acted. Okay? He wrote a letter to Felix. And now he's providing protection. He's sending all these troops uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he's letting Paul escape. And we are told that by night. Okay? Why by night? Because there is danger in Jerusalem. If this were to happen uh, in the, um, um, like before, the Jewish people there, they would have found out that, you know, the commander is sending this man Paul away. So let's do something and kill him. But instead, at night, with great protection, they brought him to Caesarea. And they delivered the letter to the governor. And they also presented Paul to him. And so when the governor, Felix, had read the letter, he understood. Uh, he asked, um, you know, a little bit about Paul. So he asked him, okay, Paul, you know, where are you from and all. And Paul revealed to him that uh, I am from Cilicia. Okay, so he understood, okay, looks like this man is from our region. Um, and uh, you know, uh, maybe Felix didn't want to rush the whole matter. So he says, okay, fine. You know, uh, I will do one thing. I will hear you when your accusers also have come. So he wanted a fair trial. He wanted to hear what Paul had to say. But at the same time, he also wanted to uh, listen to the accusations you know, which the uh, people against him had made. So he said, okay, I'm going to hear you later. All right. So then after five days, you know, we are told that the same high priest, you remember the high priest who uh, was offended when Paul said, I lived with a good conscience before God. That high priest, you know, he comes with elders and he also brings an orator. So those days they had um, like a lawyer, you, know, you could say like a lawyer, but they call them more of an orator because I don't know whether today we know the lawyers, you know, they will do the research and they will work on a case and then they will present it. But here sounds more like you know somebody who would be told the matters and they will share it, they will speak it or present before the authorities. So Tertullus was one of these orators who uh, Ananias brought along and they also gave evidence to the governor against Paul. So you know, they are presenting all these things. So Tertullus, he calls him. Um, uh, and Tertullus begin, begins, okay. Uh, yeah, so he starts by exalting and you know speaking well of the governor so he says seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your force you know all this just shows that they were trained like that that first you must flatter or uh, you know speak highly of the authorities that you you are going to uh, present your case to so it shows how um, uh, you know like a textbook way he starts by praising Felix. He says, okay, you know, uh, prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. 
we accept it always and in all places most noble felix with all thankfulness okay so so he's doing his part uh, in the format that he was thought of and now you know, he begins to uh, bring accusation against paul and look at what he says he says we found this man a plague a creator of dissension among all the jews throughout the world and a right and a ring leader of the sect of the nazarenes where, where is the background for these accusations that we, they are making against paul we'll find out okay but they outright believe that if they make paul look bad then the authorities will go by what they are saying okay so he says all kinds of wrong things about paul as if he is a man who has created trouble among the people and you know using words like this man is a plague can you imagine you know uh, so obviously it was not at all easy for paul uh, being a man who is so uh, we've seen right like how he is so um uh, he he wants to obey god he wants to keep the law even when he makes a mistake he corrects himself you know is that kind of an individual and when without any basis people are saying uh, wrong things about him it must have deeply disturbed him and uh, you know made him feel so bad but you know what to do he is serving god and he is standing up for the gospel and these are all things that he needed to go through so the accusations continue so tertullus he continues and he says that uh, um, he tried to profane the temple but again what is the evidence that he tried to profane the temple when paul was trying to present his defense uh, over there in jerusalem before the jews they didn't even let him talk he just started he gave a background and they uh, you know got angry when he mentioned the gentiles so they have not given him an opportunity finally when he came to the council before the pharisees and the sadducees again over there you know, they started fighting among each other and he never had a chance so how in the world are they making these accusations against paul but look at that bravely they're just putting it out there okay this person he tried to profane or defile the temple and we caught him and then uh they are also saying we wanted to judge him according to the law but the problem was that man lysias okay or the commander his name is being mentioned here uh, because he is the one who took him out of our hands uh, and commanding his accusers to come to you so see we would have solved this problem in jerusalem itself but you know that commander he interfered and uh, you know he is the one who is asking you to examine his case so basically uh, now the stertulus says okay fine so you examine you examine you ascertain all things um, but the situation is such that we are quite clear that this paul is in the wrong and that he needs to be killed okay now stertulus has presented his point a paul he does not have an orator like ananias brought an orator with him but paul it's his turn to defend himself so then you know uh, the governor looks at paul and says okay come on you need to share now and now you know paul begins to unveil the the things that had happened to him so one of the beautiful things as we are studying or uh, rather listening to paul's speeches is you know it not only uh, is a defense but it reveals more about his life it reveals more about uh, you know how god was dealing with him also so i just want you to pay attention okay to those additional insights and those additional details that will come up uh, and also i'm noticing the time is uh, uh, only we are only 4 minutes away uh, from the class getting over so i i think i will start with paul's defense to governor felix in the next class okay uh, because then we can continue from there all right and uh, uh, yeah let's see i don't know if in the next session 
we are able to finish off the book of acts maybe maybe two more weeks we will have to continue okay so yeah let me just stop with that uh, and uh, wanted to ask uh, the online students have you seen the assignment questions yes ma'am yes ma'am okay is it clear any any doubts no doubt no no okay and the chapter right uh, three journey of pauls that yes. detail okay yeah so i i have re- i have given there uh, the details you would have to write down you know the timeline the places where he went some of the special special events that took place maybe there's a healing or a deliverance or you know somebody uh, that paul ministered to who is a man of influence or something like that so what are the special events over there and then additionally you know any of your key learnings from what uh, happened in that city so that is how you need to do it okay yeah i think that's also quite clear so let's wrap up uh, this morning session i would request either aran or kiran to please pray and then we can end the call okay that's it yeah sure oh thank you for giving us a privilege to learn from the life of paul even today lord whatever you have revealed from uh, paul's life and from your word lord let our heart our life uh, put into practice so that lord father we will live and walk in truth and lord uh, thank you once again for this wonderful time of learning and uh, may your spirit uh, guide us all rest of the day in jesus name i pray amen yes amen thank you ma'am thank you ma'am yeah Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Kiran. See you. Bye.